Hello and welcome back to Arches. We will be continuing where we left off, which is, if you recall, uh, after Cam accidentally fell into the lake after he was following a vision that he was seeing about a girl that was attacked and who was killed. Also, right after that, um, Artie showed up. Unfortunately, it seems like he might not have brought what Devin was hoping for, which was his truck, so that he can you know, take his jeep out of the, you know, ditch that they're in, but, oh well. Well, well, anyways, let's see what happens next. Devin sighs as he watches Artie squat down behind his jeep, examining the wheel's balance above the cracked and dusty asphalt. She it! How did you manage to do this? It looks like you literally drove straight off the road. Devin sighs deeply as he stands next to Cameron, practically fantasizing about getting into the beat-up sedan and escaping this hellish town. They're so close to getting out of here, and the bear just wishes he could pick them both up and toss them into the car. Sure, he could technically do that if he wanted to, but that obviously isn't a reality. He just knows that to go against Cameron's wishes right now would be devastating to the Coyote and their relationship. All he can do is write this out and hope that they'll be on their way within the hour. Devin notices the silence after Artie's question, and the cat is looking up expectingly. Not wanting Cameron to be put on the spot, the bear clears his throat. We thought we saw something on the road and swerved. It was probably just a rock or something. Artie looks back at the road, where there definitely isn't a rock. Devin sees Cameron rub at an arm subconsciously out of the corner of his eye. It was in the middle of the night, so, you know, shadows and shit. Huh. Hard to imagine you overreacting like that, Dev. Glad you guys are okay, though. Must have been rough looking at how deep the tires went. It was. Hey, how long do you need to rearrange for the drive? I can take the wheel if you're too worn out. Ha. Huh. Right after you crashed your own car? It was the middle of the night! Hey, I'm just playing, dude. Chill. Already raises a brow at the bear glancing at Cameron. Uh, you guys alright? Kinda feels like I walked in on a fight or something. Dev massages just above his eyes, with the thumb and the middle finger. No. I'm just really tired, man. We were up most of the night. Artie then looks to Cameron, waiting for a response from the coyote. Dev tries not to bristle at the implication that Cameron might have a different response. Uh, yeah. We're just tired. I think walking around a little bit would do us some good. Oh, yeah. Last time I went ghost hunting with Dev, it was real spooky. Even though we didn't see anything. One of my top ten highs, in fact. Kikes. Artie jogs back to his car. I got some oil cartridges from the dispensary on the way here. You guys want to hit? Dev's stomach turns as he watches Artie grab a vape pen from the passenger seat. No, we are good, man. I don't know if it's a good idea for you to do that and drive anyway. Are you hiking right now, actually? Haha, <laughs> no, and I'll have come down by the time we're done looking around. Devin can't manage to say anything more before Artie takes a deep, long pull from the pen, a red light on the tip pulsating to life in time with his intake of breath. How do you know if I'm good? Cameron's voice is so low, Dev almost doesn't hear it. What was that, honey? You just said we're good, without even asking me. Uh... Devin doesn't know what to say anyway, because Cam just doesn't do drugs. The coyote would even joke that he's a straight edge. I you stoked? Dev struggles for words as Artie looks to Cameron, then Devin, then back again as he continues to hold in the vapor he inhaled. Anyway, I don't mind taking a hit if that's okay with you, Artie. Artie exhales loudly and holds out the pen to Cameron. Yeah, of course, dude. Dev stares incredulously, the disbelief building until he can't hold it back. Cameron, what are you doing? Artie looks at Devin with wide eyes, but Cameron only spares him a glance before plucking the pen from Artie's paw and taking a deep hit. Dev stares at the pulsating red light, then at Cameron's face, whose eyes are closed. Dev can't tell what Cameron's thinking right now, but whatever it is, 
Devin knows this isn't the behavior of the coyote he's gotten to know over the years. It's juvenile, and Cameron is usually more mature than the bear when it comes to stuff like this. Okay, I'll just play along like everything's fine between you two. Either way, maybe we should just go? Dev feels his chest loosen a bit with relief at hearing those words, at hearing some sense from someone other than himself. But Cameron frowns and opens his mouth. Instead of words, he begins to cough explosively into his elbow, seemingly unable to catch his breath. Hey, are you alright? Dev walks over to Cameron, rubbing his back. Yeah, that's normal, especially with a big hit like that. You handle your weed pretty good? He doesn't smoke weed, dude. That's what I assumed. I smoked <clears throat> plenty back in <clears throat> high school. <clears throat> Never hit <clears throat> one of these, though. Cameron seems to be catching his breath, finally. That's harsh as fuck. Like, worse than a blunt. You get used to it. Besides, you only need to hit it a few times to get high. Should I take another, then? No, you shouldn't. Cameron narrows his eyes at Dev. Why are you acting like this, Dev? It's just marijuana. I never complain when you drink. Because this isn't like you at all, Cameron. Dev had been holding the conversation back from becoming personal, if only because Artie is here. But at this point, he can't stop himself. He's starting to wonder if all of this goes deeper than he'd like to think. In the awkward silence that follows, Artie quickly takes the pen from Cameron. Well, uh, I think one hit is good for now. Especially if this is your first time smoking in a while. Let's see how you feel in 20 minutes. He pauses and tilts the pen in his paw towards Devin. You sure you're good? I know we only got high together a few times, but I don't want you to feel left out. No. It's not my thing. Devin looks at Cameron. You told me back in college that it wasn't your thing either. That's the only reason why I said we were good. Sorry, man. No problem. It's just been a while, so... Why not have a go, right? Dev sighs loudly and folds his arms, shaking his head in resignation. I guess so. Artie quietly takes another hit off the pen before tossing it back into the car. If it makes you feel better, Artie puffs out his chest as he lets out the breath. Shit's a lot safer than alcohol, or most any drug, really. Oh, spare me, dude. I'm not in the mood for a stoner talk right now. It's true. I think it's physically impossible to overdose on it. That's not the point, Cam. It's more mentally foggy, you know? Artie shrugs. Depends on the person. I think Cameron's old enough to know what's good for him. Artie keeps his tone light, but Devin feels himself actually bristle at that. It's like he's being made out to be the controlling boyfriend, so the bear just looks away in frustration. It doesn't matter what the cat thinks. Well, Artie was a good friend in college, he didn't know all that much about Devin and Cameron's relationship, or Cameron's past. The bear knows this coyote, and this is not like Cameron at all. He just hopes that whatever it is that's going on with his boyfriend will stop when they leave the town. Cameron stares across the lake, noticing how the light blue of the water almost perfectly reflects the blue of the sky. Is that why lakes are blue? Because they're just a reflection of what's above? Is that why it becomes dark and murky when the weather is cloudy? Oh shit, that's crazy. The seemingly profound realization is what makes Cameron suddenly realize that he's very, very high. At first, Cameron finds it funny, and he laughs out loud, only to stumble over nothing as his limbs suddenly feel intensely heavy. Whoa! What was funny suddenly becomes somewhat alarming, and the coyote's giggling dies away almost instantly. Cameron quickly walks back to the road, where Dev and Artie are, trying not to look like his legs are both 50 pounds heavier. Just a minute ago, he'd walked to the shore to put his clothes back on, and everything had been fine. Now he's in a different world. He leans back against the car, folding his arms, trying to ignore the intensifying gravity. Fuck. He's never been this high before. His 16-year-old self would be able to handle this no problem, but the shroom trip he went through sometime during junior year had ruined most reality distorting drugs for him. Even when he smoked the cheap weak bud his friends provided through high school, he would still come close to freaking out. But he always had an oxy back in those days to calm himself down, or at least whatever benzo he managed to steal from his mom's medicine cabinet. Now, there's nothing between him and feeling like time and reality are completely fucked. 
permanently fucked? Like how shrooms permanently fucked his sense of self? Can we do that? Stop. 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 You fucking idiot. Stop psyching yourself out and man the fuck up. Dev had been right, of course. What the fuck was he thinking? Well, he knows what it is that he's been thinking. While he'd made a fuss about Dev answering for him, in reality, it had been a spur of the moment's decision. Because when Artie offered the pen, he remembered that seeing things always became easier when he was high. It wasn't really a positive part of being high, but if he's going to be doing the psychic shit, maybe he should experiment more with it? He feels very differently about it now. Weed seemed like a good harmless way to test his experiment ten minutes ago, but now Cameron is questioning if Weed even triggered supernatural stuff for him in the first place. He was always on other stuff whenever he smoked weed after all. Opioids, stimulants, disassociatives, and definitely hallucinogens like shrooms did the trick. But for obvious reasons, he's never going to try those things again. He just needs to relax and be aware if something happens. Oh yeah, he's blazed. <laughs> Cameron opens his eyes, looking towards Artie in confusion. Huh? Babe, you're right. The coyote looks at the bear, still confused. What's wrong? I just asked if you're feeling okay, and you were totally spaced out. Artie, just stop freaking him out. Everything's fine, alright, Cam? I am fine. It's you acting like something's wrong that's freaking me out right now. We are kind of buzzkills, Devin. You got water? Let's get him a drink. Devin takes Cameron's paw. Sorry. Let's get water, okay, honey? Seeing Dev transform from frustrated to concerned immediately makes Cameron feel better. While he'd acted rebellious to somewhat disguise his intentions, he doesn't actually want the bear to be mad at him. He'll explain to Devin later why he did this, if it actually ends up working. Just telling him right now, with Artie right there, would be way too complicated for his brain right now. Drugs hold a lot of baggage for him, like they would for any former addict, and Cameron doesn't doubt that Dev is not pleased in the slightest with what he's doing right now. For now, he squeezes Devin's paw in his own and smiles at the bear squeezing back. Cameron giggles. Holy shit, I have never been this high before, and that was a single mouth hit. Oil cartridges are insane. Yeah, I swear it gets more potent every year, and I'm not surprised it knocked you on your ass. Cameron vacantly watches Dev climb into the rear of the jeep, grabbing their plastic bottles and one of the gallon jugs of water. How long is a come up? Am I gonna get more high? Only if you take another hit. You want to? Dev looks up from the unpack. Dev looks up from unpacking their food and water, biting his lip. But Cameron shakes his head. Nah, I'm good. Just wondering. So just relax. You'll start coming down within an hour. That sounds good. One time I did shrooms and I got stuck in it for eight hours. It felt like forever. Like, literally forever. Ugh, no thanks. That shit freaks me out. I'm not into stuff that changes you for good, you know? Yeah, it definitely changed me. And not in a good way. I mean, some people change for the better, but others just kind of end up mentally fucked up. And that was me. No shit. What'd it do? Just the idea that a few nasty tasting mushrooms can change your entire universe makes everything feel... fake. I guess. Like, everything that makes us who we are, our brain signals or whatever, can be so easily manipulated. You realize nothing's real, and for my friends that was something that actually motivated them to be better people. For me, I just cared less and less. The weed is making him open up about things he normally wouldn't, and the coyote isn't sure if that's a good thing. Sure, it opened up my mind. But no one ever tells you that you can't close it when it, you're done. You can't ever close it. I should have listened when they told me I needed to be in a good place for it to have a good impact on me. I wasn't in a good place at all. The stress of the past day, on top of remembering that traumatic event, makes Cameron's eyes well up. Probably also because of the weed. Hey dude, you okay? Um... Tears spill over, and now he's truly crying. Despite knowing it must look ridiculous, it feels meaningful and poignant. A good cry. It doesn't make it any less embarrassing. Devin, with an expression both worried and exasperated, pauses in his rummaging for water and food to rub Cameron's arm and kiss the side of his head. I'm sorry I thought this would help me see ghosts. 
I don't even know why I did this. I wasn't mad at you at all. Devin studies Cameron closely for a moment, and Cameron's blood runs cold at the thought that, for whatever reason, what he just said is fucked up enough to make Devin question why he's with this crazy canine in the first place. But Devin quickly goes on, as if Cameron didn't say anything. Sit down and keep some water, honey. He holds up a green plastic bottle filled with water and Cameron drinks from it loudly. And food. Devin pushes a bag of jerky along with a box of cheese crackers towards Cameron. Why is Devin always so nice when he's such a dick? Thanks, Devin. I'm sorry I'm such a piece of shit. What? Pony, where did that come from? I know that's something you wouldn't say, but I'd rather you tell me when I'm being awful. I don't want to go back to the way I was. It's quiet for a moment. Wow, this got you that fucked up, huh? That's all you gotta say? Dev doesn't sound angry at Artie anymore, much to Cameron's relief. Just very tired. Still, this is all pretty standard stuff, especially when you got low tolerance. And I'm not trying to be a dick when I say that. I'm actually a little jealous. Correct me if I'm wrong, Cam, but it looks cathartic as hell. You're not being a dick. It's just not a smart thing to say right now, Arturo. Artie's right. I feel really in touch with my feelings right now, and... Cameron absentmindedly shoves a cracker into his muzzle and stops. The salty, savory flavor so satisfying, he has to use all his focus to appreciate it. Fuck, that's good. Arturo laughs. Cameron shoves a strip of jerky that's lightly seasoned with hot sauce into his mouth, combining the flavors, and he moans again. Devin sighs in a defeated but accepting sort of way. That makes Cameron feel even better. That even though he did something stupid, Devin seems to understand. Hey, let me in on some of that. Alright, but it's slow. This food is for survival, not for your munchies. We'll be out of here by noon, Dev. Relax. Devin sighs as he leans up against the tailgate, covering his face with his paw, then grunts with annoyance as he has to move to let Artie by. Ah, uh, trust me, I'm trying. Seeming to disregard Devin's advice to take it slow, Artie starts cramming jerky into his mouth, moaning like Cameron. Mmm, snacks are so much better when you're high versus like an actual meal, you know? Cameron doesn't know, but nods enthusiastically. I can't believe this. Devin's tone is one of actual disbelief. Arturo glances lazily at Cameron. Is Dev being... Is Devin being a fucking Nazi about everything a new thing? Or have you been putting up with this for a while? It's weird after knowing how he acted in college. Cameron leans against the tailgate, smiling at Devin. I, I know, I've been doing some dangerous shit during our investigation, and Dev is just trying to keep us safe. He's wonderful and I love him. Devin looks at him and just gives him a small smile without saying anything. Oh, you're gonna let me in on what's going on between you two? Because I think we can all admit that it's been super awkward so far. Hasn't it though? This must be fucking weird for you. They're both laughing and the anxious snorts that Cameron makes only make him snort louder. It's just not really something that you need to know about. I know that's not rude, but... I'm psychic. Devin's eyes widen and Cameron can't help but feel the silence that follows. Huh, like, you can see the future, or... I can see ghosts, and maybe the future. I don't really know how it works. I'm trying to figure it out. Cameron hadn't really given it much thought, but seeing the future seemed to be part of it. Dude, that's fucking awesome! Devin shifts around, and Cameron can tell that he's not exactly happy about him talking to Artie about this. He has to wonder why. Shit. I think my aunt was super psychic. Super psychic? As opposed to what? Sorta of psychic? Nah, she had like tarot cards and shit, and told half my siblings that were up to shady shit that the cartel was gonna disappear them. Well, did they get disappeared? I mean, one died during routine surgery, but the cartel wasn't involved, as far as I know. Haha, <laughs> that's so sad. I don't know why I laughed. It's cool, I get it. So, not really psychic, or at least not like himself. It feels wrong to him, but Cameron feels almost dismissive of anyone that doesn't see things like he does. He's different, in a good way, 
and for once he feels like he can admit that. He had seen his friend's death a few months before it happened, and he had dreams that were so accurate to the future that it had seemed almost like deja vu. I want to go for a walk. Everything looks really neat right now. Well, that's dope. Let's go see some ghosts now. Devin sighs heavily again, but helps Cameron down from the trunk, the coyote leaning against him as they start walking. At this point, Devin has resigned himself to the fact that Cameron is going to do what he wants, and all Devin can do is respect his decision, while already reminding him more than once that Cameron is an adult had been annoying. It's also true that Devin has no right to take that decision away from Cameron. Still, there's a part of him that's hurt that Cameron would disregard his own feelings on the matter, especially after opening up to him by the lake. But Devin also disregarded Cameron's feelings when bringing him here, at least to an extent. An extent that the bear had thought was reasonable. Now, it seems like he's reaping what he sowed. Still, Devin remembers and brings up something that should keep them from venturing too far into the town. We should only go as far as the motel. Cam and I had a brush with some gun-tooting redneck near the other side of town last night. Whoa, really? Cameron giggles. One yelled at us from really far away, and Dev ran so hard he got a gnarly cramp in his thigh. Again? He had a shotgun. Doesn't that bother you guys? Artie? Artie shrugs. Meh. I've had guys flash their guns at me on the road because I flipped them off. Every one of them is too chicken shit to shoot. And this was even when I flew the O Azul y Blanco on my car. Well, lucky for you, people here don't even know what that is. Now, if I were to mount a sonoran flag on my jeep while also flipping the beard... Anyway, I say we stick around this area, no further than the motel. You should be more careful, Hardy. I swear, I hear a road rage story every few months where someone gets shot. Honestly, Cam, if it's my fork in the road, I say let it happen. You gotta live, and if that involves getting shot on the freeway because you made fun of someone's driving, then so be it. Is it really a fork in the road if the other option is death? Yeah, one of the roads just leads to a dead end, or something. I don't know, I'm high as hell right now. I'd say that's right. I think the metaphor is more appropriate for long-term consequences though, you know? Devin just smirks at the meaningless banter about the fork in the road metaphors that must seem so profound to them right now. You know? My mom always talked about her fork in the road being in the fifth grade, and that it led to her having a shitty life. Seems kinda young to have a decision like that come up. I think she just likes to point at a moment in, in no. I think she just likes to be able to point at a moment everything went wrong. But they'd been hyping up the space shuttle launch for months, and she decided that she was going to be an astronaut. She went to the public library for the first time in her life to check out a book about astrophysics and stuff. Dev suddenly has a good idea of where this is going. Then, while the whole class was watching the liftoff live on TV, it exploded. And even though her teacher turned it off and went about the day like nothing happened, they all knew those astronauts were dead. It made her question all her plans. And she drifted through life after that, not knowing what she wanted to be anymore. Damn, that's fucked up, man. Do you know why that happened, by the way? Cameron gives Dev a confused look, and so does Artie, like they forgot he's even there. Why my mom didn't know what to do? It's because she watched a clip of smiling, waving astronauts getting on a space shuttle that then exploded live on TV, Devin. Devin sighs, realizing that he needs to be more clear with what he's trying to say to this high version of Cameron. No. I mean, why that space shuttle exploded? Uh... Because rockets and fuels can cause explosions, right? No. Well, yeah, but mainly... Dev refocuses his train of thought. It's because they didn't listen to their engineers, you know? The people that stand between you and a pancake shopping mall, or a freeway bridge collapsing during rush hour, or an exploding space shuttle. Dev raises his brows meaningfully at Cameron, though weirdly enough, he realizes that he's mainly talking to himself. Always listen to your engineer. His half-ass attempt at making conversation about listening to his advice quickly backfires, though. Well, if those engineers were like the ones in Pueblo, I'm willing to bet more people would have listened to them if they didn't act like such know-it-all pricks. 
Someone's still sore from having to drop out of their mayor. Fuck you two. Hey, come on guys. We're feeling good right now. You know, Artie, I've dated an engineer for five years now. They gotta talk down to you to do their job. Cameron walks against Devin and playfully nudges him with the shoulder. Even though Cameron is playing along with what Devin started, hearing his boyfriend say that actually stings a little bit. Babe, I don't talk down to you. I don't mean to him anyway. Arturo makes a face and Dev does his best to pretend like he doesn't see it. Hey, I'm just kidding. I agree with you. If people let disasters happen because they're too proud to listen to experts, then fuck them. Maybe if they had, my mom would be on a space station right now. Maybe. Mistakes happen, though. They remind us to keep our ward up. Because it always sleeps eventually, you know? I think I do. Dev is pleasantly surprised that Cameron seems to be heeding his advice to be careful. For the first time in a day, he finds himself starting to relax a little. The end of this bizarre nightmare is in sight. They're already starting to circle back around to the car. You know, it's kind of amazing to think about how you two are still together. That brings Devin out of his revere rather quickly. Why is that? Well, all of our friends didn't last more than a few years out of college. And if you think about it, you and Cam are probably the biggest opposites out of all of those relationships. I think the most important thing in a relationship is getting along. If you can do that for 99% of the time, you're probably set. That and having different hobbies and spending time apart adds to a healthy relationship. Man, sometimes you sound like a self-help relationship book or something. Maybe that's why. I think it's just that we are both reasonable people. That's usually all you need. Well, I'm really happy it all worked out, especially after your first relationship. Honestly, looking back, I was basically setting up Cam to be your rebound. I wasn't really meaning to, of course. You know, I forgot how you somehow managed to always say the wrong thing at the wrong time, Marky. Well, it has been a long time, so I'm interested. I just wonder who you were before me. You said they were like a month-long fling? Artie seems to take this as a go-ahead to reveal irrelevant and embarrassing information about Dev's previous love life. He was a fox, named Jesus, right Devin? I never broke him up because the relationship lasted literally two months. A fox? Hmm. Cameron says this in a contemplative way, in a way that makes Devin uneasy, even though the coyote is probably just truly curious. Well yeah, it was short. But when he dumped Dev, like, he went through the full chick flick route and laid in bed for a week eating ice cream. I was so worried about him that I set the two of you up. Devin's muzzle burns under the fur, even hotter than the heat of the desert. Why did I ever tell you anything in confidence? Well, it's more like I saw it. Like, the entire dorm did. Is that true, Devin? To Devin's dismay, Cameron sounds genuinely interested now, combined with a genuine degree of concern. You seemed so put together when we first met. Dev avoids answering. It wasn't you that set us up. You mentioned me to your girlfriend's friend who happened to be Cameron's friend. She set us up. Yeah, yeah, you can word it how you like. But if I didn't remember them mentioning the super hot guitar coyote guy, too bad he's gay dude. Who knows where you'd be now? Ah, uh, yeah, that's me. And less than a week later, I knew it worked because I walked in on the two of you fucking. Oh god, why are you bringing that up? Yeah, why? Because it was funny. Besides, I walked in on like a dozen people going at it at some point. Hell, back when the university library was open 24-7, you had a 50-50 chance on walking in on a pair of rats getting it on. As Arturo prattles on, while Devin sulks behind a bit, wishing he'd been the one to tell Cameron about all of that, the way Artie describes it made him sound unstable in a way. The fox had been cute, but Devin never really got to know him before Jesus abruptly broke it off. When he first met Cameron, on the other hand, he was cute and hot, especially with the guitar and voice, but that was just the surface stuff. Cameron was also nice and considerate and thoughtful, and complex in ways that the bear is still trying to fully understand. He had girlfriends in high school, so people wouldn't get suspicious, but the fox had been what he considered his first real relationship and he'd simply overreacted to his first real breakup. Looking back at his 19-year-old self, it's hard to understand why it had felt like the end of the world. 
If Cameron were to disappear from his life now, it would be the end of the world. The world that he knows, at least. Maybe if for some terrible reason it did come to end, he would look back ten years from now and think the same about his twenty-five-year-old self. But he doubts that. Five years is a long time, and he plans to spend the rest of his life with Cameron. Unlike that fling in college, losing Cameron would be a traumatic, life-changing disaster. Just thinking about it now makes his throat tighten. The abyss he's felt below his feet since he was 12. That emotional scar left over from that last traumatic event in his life seems to yawn a bit wider. The bear thinks back to the point he'd been trying to make about engineers helping to avoid catastrophic failures and why it had felt like he had been talking to himself. There's a moment in which recovery is impossible, where a chain reaction of small disasters is set off that then mushroom into a tragedy. Maybe he had been reminding himself about what could happen. Or maybe he's realizing something that already happened. Why does it feel like he's already past that point? The point where he made a decision at a literal fork that set in motion a cascade of failures. There's no reason for him to feel that way considering they're minutes away from leaving. But it feels hopeless now. He ignored all the signs and he turned right. Ignored all the signs. Just like all of those officials ignored signs about their department stores, bridges, dams, and spaceships, at least until everything fell apart. Time passes quickly, and bantering with Artie and Devin had made Cameron forget what he was trying to do in the first place. He wonders if maybe that had been Devin's goal. He should be keeping his mind open, not covering up potential spirits with loud obnoxious laughs as they reminisce about their college days, because right now, he's feeling something. Something strange that he can't explain. Alright, ready to head out? Man, we didn't even find anything scary. You don't look for scary things, you let them happen. And something happened, so... Cameron can't leave now. Hey Dev, please don't be mad at me. Dev doesn't say anything, and that makes Cameron squirm. Uh, you guys gonna fight again? Can I have five minutes alone, please? No. Just five minutes, I swear, we'll be done. Cameron. I can feel something. I don't know what, but you guys are making it harder to hear. Cameron, the motel is right there. I am not leaving you here. Dev's tone is so resolute, so unshaken, that Cameron shrinks into himself, realizing he's reached Dev's limit. Already clears his throat. That's about it. But how about this? Me and Dev stand at the end of the road over there so that we can see you. Then, we can make sure that nothing bad happens. Please, Dev. I just really need to figure something out, and it's gonna bother me forever if I don't. Please? Devin's clearly taken aback by Cameron's intensity, which had been Cameron's intention. Something is wrong, and he needs to confirm it. Is... is what you're doing safe? Could it hurt you? I don't know. I don't think so. It has more to do with me than ghosts, though. Dev doesn't say anything for several seconds, seeming to be weighing multiple scenarios in his head. Okay. We will be up the road. Please be careful. And jail if you need us. Okay. Thank you. Dev kisses Cameron on the head for a long moment before walking away up the road. Artie looks back and forth, confused, before following Dev. Alone now. Cameron can tell that something is definitely different. He can't put his finger on it. But it's not just him being residually high. It's almost like he can see more clearly. Like he can see more. Meaning and nothing. Cameron isn't sure what to think about this. The weed is making it happen though. Just like he had hoped it would. But it's weak. He can hear the voices of those who have passed just barely playing along the wind. For just a fraction of a second, he thinks of trying opioids just once more, and how that would truly help him see things. The thought leaves him feeling physically repulsed to the point that he almost wretches, the visceral reaction surprising even him. Three years of substance abuse, the death of his mother, the deaths of his friends. He vividly remembers those two weeks when he quit cold turkey, hiding away in his friend's basement, in a pool of sweat, shaking, having every bathroom issue possible wanting to rip through his fur and skin, to run into the street, to run into a car. He cried constantly. He hated himself. He was worthless. 
He needed to die. He had to die. But a week later, he'd made it. He made it. But withdrawals aren't the hard part. The hard part is finding pills in a friend or relative's medicine cabinets. The hard part is crushing those pills up in neat little lines of powder, staring at them, telling yourself you don't need to do it. You don't have to do it. But you do it. Always do it. No matter how many times you get clean. Someone like Cameron needed something else to keep him clean. And that's Devin. Because the shame and heartache of Devin finding out wouldn't ever be worth it. But knowing this moment, any moment, can be far better with a single pill. Unfortunately, that feeling will always be there. So no, this is stupid. He won't touch drugs again. Not even weed. The window. At first, Cameron is only surprised. This is something he hadn't seen in months. Not since October of last year. But still, he kind of hoped this would happen. This creature, this manifestation, is somehow connected to his abilities. He always thought it to be a mental illness. But now that he knows that there's something more to all of this, maybe it's a sign. A harbinger of sorts that might lead him to important visions. Still, something about it is especially unsettling this time. Something is wrong. Something is different. And it's more than just a raincoat monster appearing. Arches and half circles. His train of thought is cut off as he notices a barely discernible movement from the creature. Aside from a handful of moments in the past, that felt like glitches more than anything else. The creature never moved. It was always like a cardboard cutout. It's no longer cardboard though. It's breathing. What's happening? He's not thinking right. This thing isn't part of Echo. Cameron knows that. So why is it acting different? More alive as if the town is amplifying it. Maybe it's just the setting. His nerves. The weed. But now he's realizing how strange it is that he's been so relieved to find out he's psychic. Doesn't he still have problems? It's not like all of those issues were just solved. Are those the voices of the dead or something else? Are those ghosts? Or hallucinations? Is there a difference? Suddenly a whole new wave of anxiety washes over the canine. Just like that, he's not sure about anything anymore. He had such a beautiful, life-changing epiphany. And now... He looks up the road towards where Devin and Artie are, but they're not there, and Cameron stares, wondering what's real anymore. He looks back at the monster standing on the window. If it's a harbinger of something important, he should go into that room. Otherwise, he'll just leave here knowing he's crazy, knowing he's on the verge of a fucking psychotic break. Oh damn it, damn it, what am I doing? And then he's moving for the window, for that monster. The whispering grows and the distortions twisting. Devin watches his boyfriend in the distance carefully, feeling his anxiety come down a bit as Cameron just seems to stand there. So, uh, what's the deal, man? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about. What happened? Did he see some fucked up shit earlier? Because you seem really, really worried. For a moment, Devin is glad already cuts him off. But then... Hey! What the fuck? Ah. Artie is already running up the road towards his car. Devin looks and sees a man standing next to the car, the hood up. Devin isn't sure what to do at first, either go to Cameron or follow Artie. Cameron seems oblivious in the distance, which is probably for the best, and doesn't look like the man is carrying any sort of weapon, so deciding his friend is going to need help, he runs after Artie. Dev runs up to the car just as the old weasel-looking man headbutts Artie in the face. Ah, fuck! Son of a bitch! Artie stumbles and falls on his ass. Hey! The weasel regards him coolly, seemingly not bothered by the fact that he just used his own face as a battering ram. Hey. Dev doesn't know what to say, mostly because he doesn't know why the guy just did what he did. Meanwhile, Artie moans on the ground, a paw to his forehead. That, at least, gives Dev the starting point. You can't just fucking do that, man! What are you doing? Adjusting things. He shows off a pair of pliers. Dev can feel his heart pounding in his ears as he sees a toolbox balanced on the bumper. Why? Give me the- Dev starts to step forward to take the pliers from the man, but a flash of light blinds him. Dev had never been in a fight before, not as an adult at least. His size usually deterred anyone from trying anything, and he normally didn't get into those kinds of situations anyway. 
so this moment takes what feels like a long time for his brain to process. He stumbles on his feet, paws uselessly outstretched, trying to refocus when something explodes in his stomach that seems to expand like a balloon under his ribcage. The bear doubles over in shock, feeling like a vacuum has opened up in his torso before he falls to his knees. <laughs> the long, strained sound of agony seems to go on forever as his diaphragm refuses to work. Only now does he realize that he's been punched in the stomach as well, and while he's had the wind knocked out of him before, it's nothing like this. How was that, fat ass? Dev goes on droning in response, a small part of him considering that he might actually suffocate to death. Holy hell, man! What the fuck is your problem? Oh, you wanna know? Devin, still with the face towards the ground, only hears movement above him, but that's followed by a gasp from Artie. I have a problem with sick fucks like you two dicking around in this place because you think it's funny. Dev is only now starting to get his breath back, but his eyes are locked on the gun in his face, and his insights turn to water, which has nothing to do with the punch. Where were you five years ago, huh? Back home with mommy and daddy living in your middle class houses. Thought you'd come out and see what the crazy meth heads are up to. How they all killed each other. The man adjusts his grip on the gun, and Dev almost chokes with fear. Either the old man is going to shoot him, or he's going to do it on accident. Is this still fun? Artie's rough breathing next to Devin is the only thing that lets the bear know that the cat is still there with him. Dude, listen, we didn't mean... You listen, dude. I gave you assholes a whole fucking day to get the fuck out, but you're still here. Since you're so goddamn comfortable, hope you don't mind being stuck here for good. With that, the man turns away, sticking his gun down his pants before walking off the road, straight through the sagebrush. Holy shit. It's a seven mile walk to the freeway. I suggest you leave the moment it gets cool. And that's friendly advice. There's much worse out there than me. You stupid fucks. Artie bends over Devin, who slowly stumbles to his feet, hunched over, his stomach aching far more than his muzzle, which he wipes clean of blood. Fuck, man. What did he do? Artie looks back to his car and Dev, and sees wiring sticking out from the hood already. I can't fucking believe this. Hang on. I'm getting him. Yeah, I'll see if this thing is even worth coming back for. Devin jogs up the road grunting with each step, each one sending a jolt through his stomach. While the weasel hadn't moved in this direction, Dev isn't taking chances. He also needs to make sure the coyote is. Cameron? He shouldn't be panicking, not yet, but that feeling is starting up again, and after having a gun pointed in his face. Cameron! No answer. Dev heaves for air, looking around, looking around until he sees a flash of flannel through a motel window. He's next to it in a second, unable to fit, so he pries back boards with his bare paws. Then he pushes through and tumbles into the dark, thick blackness. To be continued. And that's the end of this update. <sighs> Hopefully Cam is okay, and not just because I like playing Cam because I like Cam. <laughs> um, but... Do any of you recognize that weasel with those scabs and scrapes all over him? I'm pretty sure if you guys have either played or listened to my Echo playthrough that you'll be able to um, identify the weasel. I'm not going to say who it is, but you know, like if you haven't seen the Echo playthroughs, you might as well. <laughs> Anyways, um, I wonder if another bear is going to show up eventually. Hopefully not for the sake of Cam and Devin, but I'm pretty sure he is. I mean, he, he was at the beginning of this uh, visual novel. Ugh. But yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play Arches yourself, I will put a link down in the description. If you would like to support the Echo Project and get early access to this, as well as their other works, such as The Smoke Room, I will also put a link down for that. And I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye.